Thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our uh, first and the most distinguished speaker, uh, Avi Wigderson. Avi obtained his uh, PhD in Princeton after uh, studies in Haifa, and then he was working in Hebrew University and uh, since over 20 years uh, at Princeton. But the thing that he's most known for are the prizes that he got for his amazing research. So um, two years ago, he obtained Abel Prize, but earlier he also got Nevanlina Prize, Gödel Prize, Knut Prize, and lots of other prizes. So it's really great honor to have you here, Avi. Please, uh, the floor, I would say, but the time is for you. Uh, and the talk will be about the value of errors in groups. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, happy to be here or there. I don't know if how you call it. Let me um, share the screen. Okay, good. So uh <clears throat> the title uh, the value of errors in proofs and uh, the subtitle i will explain it's uh, basically i want to tell you the revolution in the notion of uh, what a proof is uh, uh, which started uh, in computational complexity about 30 years ago and uh, <clears throat> is still going on so um yeah in the picture you see my favorite proof system. Uh, we'll do more than that. Okay, now let's see why doesn't it move. Okay, the plan of the talk is simple. I want to talk about this value of errors in proofs. I'll, uh, it has impacts of all sorts, science and technology. I will not, maybe I'll mention some, but mainly the conceptual nature of uh, the new proof systems and the paradoxical properties they can have and the uh, connections with the uh, math and as we'll see with physics uh, at the very end of the talk. But to talk about the value of errors in proofs, I need to talk about the value of errors in computations beforehand. And before that, I need to talk about proofs and computations without errors. And uh, uh, that's what we will start from. But really the you know, central message uh, I want to convey is the value of the methodology of computational complexity. What you will see is a story and evolution uh, of ideas and how one leads to another. And in all of them, the basic uh, focuses that uh, we have on modeling uh, resources, on algorithmic efficiency, on classifying problems in complexity classes and so on plays an essential role. Uh, okay, let me start. By the way, uh, stop asking me questions. You are a small group if something is unclear, okay? Uh, yeah, so proofs and computations go hand in hand for millennia. Uh, I want to just touch on two points in this very long history. Uh, first is the Euclid, uh, the elements, uh, the textbook, the only textbook in math for some like 1500 years, uh, as you all know, contain proofs of theorems, many theorems in plain geometry. All of them are deducible from five simple axioms. So it's a book of theorems and proofs, but actually all the proofs are constructive uh, and in fact contain algorithms for what they promise to deliver. Uh, these are all constructions of points in the plane using only straight edge and compass. So here in this theory, theory of geometry on the plane, proofs and computations are the same. What you can prove, you can compute and vice versa. Uh, we jump two centuries ahead. <clears throat> Hilbert, uh, now in, in other areas of mathematics and maybe mathematics in general, uh, believe that uh, what happens in plane geometry should happen everywhere. That truth in mathematics is the same as probability. Everything that's true can be proved. And in fact, everything that can be proved can be computable, can be computed. 
And uh, as you, again, I'm sure you know, this dream was shattered big time during his life by Gezel, first of all, who proved the incompleteness theory. I'm showing you that the first equal hypothesis, uh, you know, hypothesized equality is wrong. There are things that are true that cannot be proved in axiomatic systems. And then Turing came and showed that there are provable things that cannot be computable. I'm going to talk about Turing's work. Uh, this came from his, in his famous paper, which also actually defines what an algorithm is. So the notion of computability was not fully uh, or so clearly defined as Turing did it. And uh, for him, what, this was what we call Turing machines. Algorithms are Turing machines. Uh, one consequence of this definition and his paper was actually the computer revolution, but I'm not going to talk about this minor implication. I want to talk about theory. So algorithms are algorithms for what? There will be algorithms for decision problems. We will have a set S in mind, set of whatever numbers, graphs, any set of objects. And we are given a, an element X, and we want to know whether it's in the set or not. Turing um, defines uh, two classes, uh, uh, which tonight, today we call R and RE, R for recursive. This is a set, the family of sets that are computable by finite algorithms, algorithms which always hold. And RE, the recursively enumerable uh, class of sets, which one way to think about them, it will become clear, is sets provable to finite algorithms. So finite algorithms can verify them. And his famous theorem uh, already shows that uh, what lots of people in the street don't know is that computers cannot do everything. They are uh, provable. Uh, sets which are not computable. I just want to mention that uh, if we scale this down to replace finite by efficient algorithms, uh, then we immediately get the uh, famous classes P and NP. Here efficient means polynomial time. Of course, you can have other notions, but if you set efficient algorithm to be polynomial time, then you get the classes P and NP, and the big question in uh, the computational theory, and in fact in mathematics, one of the most important question is whether the analogous inequality holds here, whether P is equal or unequal to NP. So it can be defined in this same way. I want to start by giving examples of uh, uh, <clears throat> proof systems and all the notions that go with them uh, that we will play with in the, the talk. Uh, claims, arguments, proofs, uh, proof systems, provers, verifiers, just to uh, then get to a general definition of a proof system. And uh, it's a, you'll see that it's an algorithmic definition. All its variants will be algorithmic. And this is a, one thing about the focus of complexity theories. So in general, we what we try to understand is when it is an argument convincing. And we'll have two players in this uh, game. There's some claim that uh, an element belongs to some set. This is known by everybody. And there's a verifier, an algorithm who wants to, you know, know if this is true or not, or, uh, or be convinced that this is true. And he's eager to know this, but he's computationally limited. On the other hand, we have the prover. Uh, in this, these pictures are inspired by Baba's definition uh, of Arthur Merlin games. So you see King Arthur and the magician Merlin. So prover is a magician, somebody who has infinite powers and can can prove anything provable, but uh, we don't trust him. Okay, and then to be convinced that a verifier gets an argument from the prover and uh, you know using uses it to decide whether he believes the claim is true or not. 
So let's see some examples and how they lead to proof systems. Uh, here's the proof system for the set of composite numbers. So this set of numbers, there can be a claim, some number here written down is composite. Here's an argument for it. It's two smaller numbers whose product is that input. And what is the verification? It's obvious. Uh, <clears throat> you multiply the two sides and you see whether you get the input and decide to accept or reject accordingly. So this is a, a proof system. It tells you exactly when the verifier accepts or rejects a claim. And of course, checking, and this is this will be in all proof systems, checking, verifying has to be efficient. Of course, here it's a multiplying integers is simple. Uh, this example generalizes to any, uh, right, to any composite number. And uh, <clears throat> the theorem, you know, the claims provable in the system are simply the set of composite numbers. For primes, you cannot do it. Uh, because we want both numbers to be smaller than the input. One point about proof systems in general, again, is that the argument that uh, is supposedly convincing, we don't care about how complicated or how computationally inefficient it's, uh, you know, getting it is. We don't care about the complexity of the prover. Indeed, in this example, uh, you know, it seems to requ require factoring, and factoring is probably a hard problem, at least the world believes so. And the work of cryptography, security on the internet rests on this assumption. But I just want to show this as an example of a proof system for some set. Here's another set, the set of solvable Sudoku puzzles. So a claim can be here, I give you this uh, <clears throat> table with numbers, and a claim is a solvable. What would be a convincing argument is just filling the table with the remaining missing numbers and what is verification. Uh, you know, again, the argument may be hard to find. I mean, maybe not for this puzzle, but in general. And the verification, just checking that this uh, full table satisfies the, um, um, you know, Sudoku rules. So again, we have, uh, you know, checking this is very, very simple. Uh, the set of theorems provable in this uh, way by this uh, proof system is a set of solvable Sudoku puzzles, right? Unlike the puzzles in the newspaper, uh, some puzzles, of course, are, you know, cannot have a completion. So these are the solvable puzzles. And I want to stress that uh, I always want to talk about an infinite set of theorems proving, you know, when sizes grow. And here, as some of you know, of course, it's easy to generalize Sudoku to any, uh, to any, size so is a four by four example and you can get to n by n um if uh, you know this zoom is not a good uh, a good uh, form to ask questions for, from the audience so i'll just say uh, i usually ask what do people believe uh, is harder uh, solving sudoku puzzles or factoring integers, and they always answer the factoring is out. But of course, uh, solving Sudoku puzzles in general is NP hard, and uh, factoring is probably not, so <laughs> uh, There is a reduction from factoring to Sudoku solving. Anyway, here's another very different and maybe more familiar proof system. This is one of the many uh, uh, deductive systems like Euclid's geometry, here uh, piano arithmetic. Here the objects are uh, expressions over, let's say the integers, uh, expressions formulas. Uh, this uh, proof system has a bunch of axioms and deduction rules like mode exponents. And here to certify that the uh, you know, formula is true, uh, that the claim is true, the claim is also a formula. It's just a list of other formulas where the last one is a claim. And for every, what the verifier does is for every uh, 
uh, formula AI checks whether either it's an axiom or it follows from previous uh, uh, AJs by one of the deduction rules. So that's a normal, uh, you know, mathematical type of uh, proof. And uh, in this particular piano arithmetic, you know, we can prove theorems like there exist infinitely many primes or Fermat last theorem and so on. Okay, so that's, that's my third example. Now we move to the general definition. Basically, what are the essentials of a proof system, of all these and other proof systems, all the many ones you find in logic books and so on? Two obvious things. What's called completeness, namely true claims have, should have proofs, and soundness is that false claims should not have proofs. These are the obvious properties. And the third, which I want to stress, is that distinguishing a convincing and faulty argument, namely distinguishing true and uh, false claims, can be done efficiently. This is essential, and this is true for all proof systems ever invented. And it should be true because the prover is supposedly smarter than the verifier. The verifier does not need to generate a proof by himself. Uh, again, we stress this uh, efficiency, uh, which for us, this talk will be polynomial time in the length of the claim, but of course, there are other definitions. So the formalizing of this slide was done by Cook and Rachel in 79. It's, you know, I'm repeating it a bit more formally, stressing that a proof system is actually defined by an algorithm. The algorithm is called a verifier. It's a machine that takes two kinds of inputs. One is called a claim, the other is called an argument. And it satisfies these two conditions we saw before. Completely, completely, namely, if the claim is true, if the element is in the set we talk about, then some argument, there exists an argument that uh, if we feed them both to the verification algorithm, it accepts. And this is a happy case in which the claim we call a theorem and the argument we call a proof. And soundness is that if the claim is false, uh, <clears throat> then every argument will be rejected by this verifier. So an algorithm defines a proof system, and this is true about all proof systems in math. Uh, we call the set of theorems uh, verified by verifier V, T sub V. And what Cook and Rachel prove, basically it's easy because more or less the definition of NP is that NP is a uh, family of uh, uh, sets T sub V, which are proved by some proof system in this, uh, you know, satisfies this definition when the verifier is a deterministic polynomial time algorithm. So NP contains uh, sets like solvable Sudoku puzzles or um, composite numbers and so on, examples we've seen. And just to note that if the verifier ignores the argument, namely looks at just at the claim and can, uh, you know, we see what theorems are in this more restrictive system, this is exactly P. That's exactly the situation that the verifier can compute by himself whether the claim is true or not, so P is contained in NP and we don't know if they are equal or not. Okay, so all this is classical uh, computational complexity and now we move to Errors in proofs. These proofs have no errors in them. I want to talk about errors in proofs, and I will start by talking about errors in computation. You know, uh, seems that nature is very benevolent and seems to provide us access to uh, random events, uh, and so we postulate that we have independent and biased coin sources. And then we can use them in algorithms. And I'm sure you all know examples of probabilistic algorithms. Basically, the difference between deterministic and probabilistic is that in a deterministic algorithm that doesn't toss coins, then uh, we, if it computes a function f, 
then on every input it outputs the function value. A probabilistic algorithm, <clears throat> which does those coin, of course the output is now a random variable, but we want it to equal the function value with high probability. So for every input, the output of the algorithm is the function value with high probability, let's say bigger than two thirds. Why bigger than two thirds? First of all, it determines the function value. You know that there can be only one value that attains this majority. And the number itself doesn't matter as long as it's uh, significantly bigger than a half. We'll see in a second why. I want to stress that uh, this is the place where errors and enter algorithms. Okay, so we, we, are, we seem to be very comfortable with errors in algorithms. This uh, one third error here is not a problem because errors can be reduced efficiently, arbitrarily, you know, as much as you want. How? Well, you simply can run your algorithm k times and take a majority vote, and this uh, will reduce the error exponentially in k. So you can reduce it even to exponentially small. Uh, what's the value of allowing errors in algorithms? Well, we seem to uh, you know, be able to solve lots more problems efficiently than without them. I want to stress this theme. It's a topic for a different lecture about the, whether this uh, is real power or imaginary power, but I'm not going to talk about this here. Uh, the rationale for allowing errors in, uh, in algorithms is, uh, you know, we basically seem to tolerate uncertainty in all other aspects of our lives, including when we cross the street. Um, why not uh, allow small errors in algorithm? And of course, it's extremely useful. Now, given that this is how uh, randomness and error enter algorithms, and given that we define proof systems using algorithms, it's very natural now to define probabilistic proof systems. Uh, this was done independently in the mid 80s by Baba and uh, Goldwasser, Mikhail Yarakov. Uh, Here is again the definition of, I showed you before, the classic definition of proof system. To make it probabilistic, we simply just make the verifier a probabilistic algorithm. And we only demand that uh, completeness and soundness are satisfied with high probability. So we introduce errors in proofs. This seems, at least on the psychological level, to be really um, much different than uh, introducing errors in uh, computations because of the value mathemat mathematics puts on a proof. I mean, proof is supposedly what distinguishes mathematics from all sciences, for example. It's something, uh, you know, which guarantees absolute truth. And suddenly we are allowing errors. Of course, we are allowing errors in the same sense as before, namely, we want the error to be small, and this is controlled by the random coin self process themselves, right, of the verifier. Uh, so for every claim, the error can be made arbitrarily small. Now, anyway, the definition, uh, these, these are also proof systems, and uh, uh, we can again label this set of theorems for this particular system with a particular verifier, T sub V. And we, we define the class of you know, uh, uh, provable sets uh, in this model, uh, the class IP. Uh, and in this slide, you've seen only half the definition because the, we allow the proof system to be both probabilistic and interactive. So I want to explain this second part. So both randomness and interaction are crucial to the new definition here. So in a classical proof like NP, uh, we said the verifier is deterministic and always uh, you know, is right. But uh, the, the interaction with the prover is simply by a message sent to the prover or by a paper written by uh, a mathematician. In the case of uh, uh, 
uh, IP, we already discussed the issue of randomness, but also the interaction is changing. We are allowing more than one message from provers to verify. We actually allow uh, a conversation between them in which the verifier may ask questions of the prover, maybe random questions, and interact for a while efficiently, and at the end decides uh, to accept or reject. So now one basic question which always should be asked about any model is this is a reasonable model, but I think this is a particularly reasonable model because that's how we do math and how we teach math. You know, we ask each other questions about details of the proof or the students in the class ask questions. So it seems very natural to allow interaction. Of course, the motivation of Goldwasser, Mikhail Rako came from cryptography, where anyway there is interaction. But the point is, it's not just reasonable. This definition is absolutely a revolutionary scientific notion. I'll discuss in the next uh, 15 minutes uh, some, some consequences of uh, this definition. There are many more I will not be able to discuss. Uh, one, uh, so it has lots of impact on all kinds, but I want to focus on uh, uh, proofs. In these proof systems, that can have really paradoxical properties, in particular zero-knowledge proofs and PCPs that I'll talk in a second in more detail about. But I also want you to see that uh, the way in which these definitions sort of evolved, uh, how actually PCP arose in a natural but a surprising way from uh, zero knowledge, and uh, how uh, we got from interactive proofs with one prover to interactive proofs with many provers, and eventually to the quantum model that I want to discuss at the end. So what are zero knowledge proofs? In the same paper, uh, uh, Goldwasser, uh, Mikhail and Rakov uh, uh, defined this variant on the interactive proof model. I want to stress that a formal definition is highly not trivial, but the intuition is very simple. What you want is that uh, you'll have an interactive proof, but on top of that, if the verifier accepts the claim, then it learns absolutely nothing from the proof. So this interaction should teach, only give confidence about the correctness of the claim and nothing else. This looks totally uh, ridiculous uh, because from experience in our daily life, we are never convincing anybody of anything unless we give them some new, some, we tell them something they didn't know. Otherwise they would <laughs> arrive at the same conclusion. So. Uh, in particular, in mathematics, it's not clear how you convince anybody that you proved such uh, big theorems. Uh, so the question was, they, they posed is which, which claims, which type of claims have uh, uh, zero noise proofs? And <clears throat> uh, surprisingly, um, a year later, Surprisingly, even for us, even though we proved it, uh, with Goldwasser and Mikali, with Goldreich and Mikali, we proved that every proof can be made into a zero knowledge proof. Everything provable is provable also in zero knowledge. Uh, this requires an assumption, the standard assumption, oops, standard assumption of cryptography, namely uh, one way functions exist. And if you have this, then uh, everything, which we might as well say uh, NP or even IP, can have a zero knowledge interactive proof. Um, this had, you know, many, many consequences. Uh, theoretically, uh, in the theory of cryptography, it's essential because it uh, sort of automates uh, uh, handling bad players in. Uh, in protocols, in cryptographic protocols, making sure that you know people behave as they should. Uh, again, to certainly my surprise, it was used in uh, 
practical situations. My surprise simply because the proof is, uh, I mean, the protocol of zero knowledge proofs, the original paper is quite complex, it didn't look practical, but people made it practical. Had the uh, more surprising consequences in pe that people took, invented analogs of it in the physical world, uh, uh, which they uh, suggested using uh, for nuclear disarmament and for uh, anonymous DNA testing and many other applications. But I want to focus on this, uh, just how this uh, zero knowledge proof system actually led to the creation of new proof systems, and in particular, the one in which you have interactive proofs with multiple provers. Okay, so let's get well there. And for this, let's look again at this zero knowledge theorem. Uh, as I said, uh, this theorem is an assumption. And the question we ask ourselves is, is this assumption essential? Maybe you can have zero knowledge proofs without this assumption. And do we really need crypto for this theorem saying that every proof can be made zero knowledge? And the answer, like many times, is yes and no. In this model of a single prover, uh, Ostrovsky and I proved that uh, actually having non-trivial zero-knowledge proofs is, a, is equivalent to having one-way functions. So you need the assumption. But uh, if you change the model, uh, you don't need it anymore. So what's a new model? This is in a paper with uh, Beno, Goldwasser, and Killian uh, a couple of years later, uh, which takes the following variant on interactive proofs. It allows two or more provers. I'll define it for two provers, but with more provers, it's, uh, it's called, you know, it's called 2IP or, or with many provers, you know, MIP, uh, some final number of provers. Um, What's the idea? The idea is that uh, now two provers want to convince a verifier of the claim. They may they both know the claim and know the verifier, and uh, they can talk as much as they want uh, beforehand. But then they are separated, and then the verifier gets to ask them both questions that uh, you know one does not hear the other. So it interacts with the left and interacts with the right for a while. Again, it's probabilistic and then decides to uh, accept or reject and it's always correct with high probability, such high completeness and soundness in the way we define. And uh, in this model, we proved that uh, everything provable has a zero knowledge to prove an interactive proof and this theorem needs no assumption, no cryptography. This is information theoretic. So in some sense, the physical separation of the provers uh, somehow replaces the computational uh, assumptions needed in the one prover case. You can ask whether this model is reasonable. Uh, this seems more far-fetched, but uh, it does have intuition, like uh, the way police interrogates uh, maybe two suspects in the in a crime, uh, put them in separate cells and interrogate them separately. That's very natural and it's being done all the time. And they want to be convinced of, uh, you know, that maybe they're guilty or maybe they're innocent using this interrogation. And uh, uh, it also was believed reasonable by the universities we were at at the time, MIT and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, because they believe it's not only reasonable, but practical, and uh, maybe uh, will be used by uh, um, uh, ATMs. When you draw money, people will have two cards proving their identity. These two cards are the two provers. And well, I will not go into detail. They, there is a patent that we all suggested will not be money will not be invested in registering it, but they did register it. And of course, it, nothing happened. But uh, anyway, uh, reasonable or not, we are going to uh, uh, investigate it. So one thing we see is that it can 
uh, proof things with zero knowledge without assumption, and this satisfied definitely me. I, I sort of left the area, or not completely, but uh, did not think about this uh, so much at the time, but just then, amazing things started happening. So let me uh, tell you some of them. And these are, they have to do not with zero knowledge, but just understanding the power of this new system. What kind of sets uh, can be proved? What is the computational complexity uh, of computing theorems proven in this uh, class? So we have this hierarchy of proof systems. And uh, it was easy to see that IP single prover is uh, anything provable there is also in P space. So only polynomial space is required. And that, uh, for two prover model or many prover model, everything prover, provable is in non deterministic exponential time. And it seems like uh, these were trivial inclusions. And uh, that uh, you know the upper bound can be much improved; that they cannot be so close to these the computational classes. But everybody was wrong. Uh, in a year came uh, a you know a sequence of amazing uh, amazing results. The <clears throat> first was IP equals P space, so single prover. Really, uh, everything in P space can be proven provable uh, in a probabilistic interactive proof with one prover. All of these results, of course, have intuitive uh, uh, meanings. In this case, uh, it seems that, uh, you know, class P space, uh, one, one set of, uh, um, of uh, uh, problems in this class are uh, games, uh, winning strategies for games. And it seems that despite the alternate, alternating, uh, you know, definition, you know, you want to win the, the white wins in chess means there is a move for white, so that for every move of black, so there is a move of white, or the move for every move of black, and so on, iterated, unbounded alternation uh, can be provable, and provable seems like uh, just uh, you know something close to empty. Uh, anyway, that was one shock, one big result. Then, uh, soon after, the power of two prover or many prover IP was shown to be exponential time, a non deterministic exponential time. And this has even uh, more interesting uh, uh, consequences. One uh, is that actually we know that in non deterministic uh, exponential time, you have things that are not in P. So, we have problems that are efficiently provable, but uh, are intractable. And moreover, this model was shown to be equivalent to uh, having exponentially long arguments. So something that, you know, paper, very long papers that efficient can only, that the very fast can only sample. And this point of view was taken Farther scaled down to the NP level in a sequence of papers, which culminates in this famous PCP theorem showing that NP uh, equals PCP. So written proofs can be verified from constant size snapshots. I'm going to say more about this in the next two slides. I'll, I'll explain what this means. So it's another very paradoxical and surprising property of a proof system. I want to stress that in all these theorems, there is no crypto or no assumptions. They are, you know, they are what they are. So what are PCPs? PCPs are another class of probabilistic proof systems and actually no interaction in them. They look like the NP uh, proof systems. The prover only sends an argument to the verifier and it satisfies the usual uh, properties of probabilistic proof systems. But it adds another really tough constraint on the verifier. So it should be right with high probability, but it is allowed to read only a constant number of bits from the argument, no matter how long the argument is. Uh, that uh, seems, uh, again, really impossible. I mean, uh, you have a, somebody gives you a 100-page proof, uh, and maybe there is a single bug on 
on page 78, what, uh, how can you find it with looking at a few bits in this uh, text? Uh, for example, if uh, I don't know what uh, Andrew Wise is doing nowadays after Fermat, but uh, maybe he's working on the Riemann hypothesis and eventually will produce, you know, this volume, uh, very large uh, text containing the proof. How can we ever verify it by looking at a few pages? Uh, although it's a few bits. Well, again, it turns out that there's a universal statement here, like with zero knowledge. If you have a proof, you can convert it efficiently into a proof of this kind, into a PCP. Uh, that's, of course, a very complex theorem to prove. Uh, that's a, this PCP theorem. Uh, what does it mean? Well, what people like to advertise it as, uh, you know, it's the uh, best news referees ever had because, you know, you can refer papers in seconds. I don't think that uh, this uh, conversion is efficient enough yet for this to have referring applications. But again, it was a major uh, result which, uh, with many, many consequences. Uh, maybe the most important is in optimization. This enables the proof of uh, hardness of approximation uh, as opposed to, you know, NP uh, tells you about hardness of finding optimal solution. PCPs tell you about hardness of finding approximate solutions. Has applications in complexity and coding theory and many more and more are discovered in cryptography and so on. Uh, and is, you know, some aspects of it are implemented in technology. Okay, so summarizing, we fully understood the uh, power of these uh, interactive proof uh, systems with one or with many provers. And now we want to switch to the last stage uh, in this uh, talk, where again, the, again, following the methodology of the field, uh, you know, we have a model, we have, uh, uh, various modes of computing. We went from deterministic to probabilistic, and then suddenly, you know, quantum uh, computing came into the scene, and now we want to investigate the power of such quantum proof systems. So, before talking about quantum interactive proofs and errors in them, I want to tell you just about quantum computation. Again, I'll have one slide, like with randomness. So, Again, uh, nature seems to provide us with the quantum phenomena and uh, Feynman and Mann in the uh, early 80s suggested that we should build computers that actually work with this quantum phenomena. They manipulate quantum superposition, superpositions with unitary operations. I'm not defining this. This is not, uh, you have to take, well, many of you have heard this and know what the meaning is. Uh, but anyway, you just think that we are using the laws of nature in our computation, which uh, in this case this, um, was quantum uh, uh, mechanics promises. No reason why we shouldn't, of course. Well, uh, we still don't know how to build quantum computers. Anyway, so even you know, formalizing the model took some some years, but it was formalized, and we have a notion of uh, like P for deterministic algorithms and BPP for probabilistic algorithms. We have uh, BQP, uh, this is a class of uh, efficient quantum algorithms in this model, and uh, which is always at least as strong as you can easily get probabilistic algorithms from quantum algorithms are at least as strong, but they actually seem stronger and the bombshell uh, landed when Peter Shaw in 1994 showed that problems we believe hard, in particular those very problems that are uh, believed hard for the purposes of uh, crypto and uh, internet security, are actually efficiently solvable by quantum algorithms. 
this had uh, you know dramatic consequences there was immediately friendly attempts to a build you know the appropriate technology namely uh, build quantum computers and uh, billions were invested by companies by governments and uh, which made huge uh, progress on the technology but are still far from factoring uh, you know three digit integers uh, <laughs> people in order to protect the world against uh, quantum algorithms if they come to be a reality uh, moved, um, people are moving away from uh, assumptions like factoring a discrete log and trying to find alternatives uh, to base crypto systems on and uh, the most favorite uh, assumption is uh, comes from theory of lattices, lattice problems, and uh, it seems like uh, it, actual most practical systems will change, will move to depend on these lattice problems for which we still don't have even quantum algorithms. Uh, people work on developing more quantum algorithms, explore, exploring the power of these uh, computers. I must say that uh, uh, even though 30 years passed, uh, we don't have many new algorithms above Peter Shaw. I mean, it was generalized, but uh, we don't have uh, good examples. Of course, we don't have any reason to think nowadays that NP can be uh, solved by quantum, efficient quantum algorithms. But I want to again focus on the development of new models uh, which integrate the quantum capacity into them, and uh, in particular to proof systems. So let me tell you about this. Um, so well, provers are obviously powerful, and we'll be more specific about what provers can do quantumly. And you let the verifier uh, be efficient as before, but now it can be quantum. And uh, a variant of IP was defined. So whenever you see star, you see you that's a notation for the quantum version. So proof systems with one interactive probabilis uh, I mean quantum proof systems are called IP star with one prover. And uh, the power of this new proof system, it took a decade, but because things are quite complicated, uh, it turns out that this quantum power does not increase the, uh, uh, you know, uh, does not, we cannot prove new theorems beyond P-space in this model. So here, quantum or probabilistic proofs are of the same computational power. Uh, in this paper, the variance with many provers, two or more provers was defined and my P-star. And here the story is absolutely fascinating. Again, it took quite uh, some time in order to show that, you know, because both provers and verifier become quantum, it's not clear the relationship to the uh, probabilistic uh, model, but here, uh, eventually people show that it's at least as strong as uh, the probabilistic model, and in particular contains non-deterministic exponential time. And I think the belief was that like in single prover, soon uh, there'll be equality and we'll be, you know, we'll see that there is no extra power there. But some years later, and a lot of work later, uh, these guys showed that actually you can uh, prove theorems which are much higher in the exponential hierarchy, non deterministic double exponential time. And then things got really interesting, and the question was where, where does it stop? How much higher? Uh, uh, in complexity classes can these quantum provers prove and uh, the final really amazing uh, uh, result came that actually uh, they can prove things that are uncomputable at all. They lie in this recursive enumerable class of Turing, namely things provable to finite algorithms in arbitrary amount of time. So I remind you that RE is different than R, so there are uncomputable 
function that can be efficiently proved to a quantum verifier by quantum, by several, two or more, no quite quantum provers. And that in itself is sort of amazing and uh, um, really, really unexpected. But what is, you know, an added bonus is that this is a deep mathematical theorem. It's not just about complexity classes that some uh, computer scientists uh, invented, but actually it has deep mathematical content as was seen by corollaries uh, that uh, refuted the variety of conjectures in different mathematical areas, uh, gave counter example to uh, a Thirson problem in quantum information theory, to Kohn's embedding conjecture in von Neumann algebras, to Kirchberg conjecture in group theory, and by now many more uh, consequences are known. These were already mentioned in the original paper. Uh, I'm not going to explain uh, these uh, mathematical problems. I mean, I, I, I even the last two I really cannot, and uh, first one I can, but we have no time for that. Um, but it's about the fundamentals of quantum uh, uh, mechanics and uh, has to do with the uh, power of two types of uh, measurements. Anyway, uh, this is a consequence of this theorem. And now many people in these mathematical areas are trying to understand what are quantum proof systems and uh, wow, you know, how this provides a, a solution to, a pro to problems that were uh, uh, worked on for decades. Uh, I just want to explain the model itself of MIP star in very clear and simple terms. And you'll see that even the original papers defining it saw how it was connected to uh, fundamental issues in quantum mechanics, which I will now explain. So for this, uh, we go back in time uh, to when MIP was defined soon after uh, this paper showed that actually, if you have multiple provers, you never need more than one round of interaction. And because of this, uh, you can define uh, MIP protocols as games. What do I mean? Uh, so without loss of generality, any uh, uh, normal probabilistic interactive proof, no quantum yet, uh, can have one question asked to each, by the verifier to each of the prover, gets two answers, and then decides to accept or reject. Namely, there's some function computable on, on these uh, Values, of course, the questions are randomized, so we have some probability of uh, uh, acceptance. And uh, we ask what, how, you know, <clears throat> what's the best uh, probability? How close to one is the probability that the verifier will accept by the best strategy of the provers? And we give it a name. That's the value of this game. The game is determined by the verifier function on the inputs and outputs uh, it asks and sees. And so it's, a, it's a, the maximum under the best over strategy of the probability. They are, they are trying to convince the verifier. So how likely is it in the best strategy that they do convince the verifier? Okay, so that's the classical value of the game. And if the verifier, okay, let me point out that this value remains the same even if the two provers are not communicating but have access to a shared random string. There is some random sequence in the sky that they can both look at and maybe help coordinate the answer. It doesn't change anything. The quantum version is very similar, only that uh, uh, now the verifier can be a quantum machine and the provers uh, are allowed to share a quantum state. So the analog of a random string is, uh, is, a, is a quantum state, so they are entangled using this quantum state. Again, I'm not explaining this. 
uh, it's a form of uh, joint you know, random variable that they both have and can measure uh, analogous to the random string above. And in this uh, new game, in which uh, the players have the different powers, we can define the sort of the quantum value of this game. So again, we have the verifier function, and we want to ask what the maximum probability that the uh, of, of our strategies to these entangled provers that they convince the verifier. Uh, in the computer science viewpoint, we ask, I mean, after all, we are interested what is a complexity class uh, containing uh, provable things, uh, provable statements. And so it's all about this success probability, right? In the completeness case, it's bigger than two thirds. In the soundness case, it may be less than one third. So the question is how hard computationally is the approximation uh, problem to the value of the game? And uh, in the classical case, we saw what the theorem was, that this is equal to non-deterministic exponential time. We know exactly uh, the difficulty of, um, of computing provable things in two IP. And similarly, I just showed you that we know it's also in two IP style. So that's the computer science uh, point of view on these uh, proof systems. But the same proof systems exist in the physics literature. I'm exagger exaggerating when I say exist, but things like them existed for a long time in the physics literature. And this is the famous uh, einstein podolsky rosen uh, uh, thought experiment from uh, 1935, which was actually done here at the Institute where I work. Uh, as you know, Einstein was uh, you know, very doubtful of uh, quantum uh, mechanics. He didn't believe it was uh, complete. And uh, uh, they, he and his postdocs proposed an experiment to test whether quantum mechanics you know, really works. And uh, you may have seen this picture, the uh, two, two photon experiment. Uh, I will not explain it, but it, if you look hard, you see, you can imagine uh, a verifier and two, uh, two provers sitting on both sides left and right, and uh, they are sufficiently separated uh, so that uh, it seems that to coordinate, they will require more than the, they, they are entangled, but it seems that coordination will require uh, being faster than the speed of light. So that was the EPR challenge. Uh, as anyway, the physicists have different names to this proof system. They, uh, Call the bottom a quantum non-local game, uh, and if it works, they they said that it's a sort of a spooky action at the distance, and uh, they were trying to explain it maybe by a hidden variable model, by a basically a classical uh, to IP uh, that's called local local because uh, yeah they have a classical uh, random string as opposed to a quantum state. And so sort of amazingly, you know, one of the, you know, this was a challenge, but people came up uh, with, uh, maybe I have it on the next slide, with examples of games uh, of this kind where the provers in the quantum world have more power, they can convince the verifier to a very, to a higher probability than a classical proof, provers. So contrasting these two, um, the physics and the computer science approaches here, uh, in physics, they were motivated by this question of whether quantum mechanics is complete. And this long sequence of papers, I'll just few listed here, there are some important ones. Uh, there was a focus on inventing games in which the uh, quantum value is bigger than the classical value, uh, maybe more and more bigger, and so on. And uh, yeah, some ingenious examples that were very important later. And also, on the practical side, 
people in the, I think it was the 70s, managed to actually implement physically this challenge of Einstein uh, Podolsky also, showing that indeed there is a spooky action on, on distance and the sort of quantum mechanics prediction are validated. Uh, in the complexity theory point of view, uh, what we do for you know any model is try to understand what are all uh, the problems that uh, you know it solves or proves or so on. In particular, for MIP star and this original paper introducing MIP star already suggested looking not at the examples but a theory of all uh, such non-local games and building for them uh, the usual. Uh, machinery of reductions between different games, ways to amplify probabilities of the value of the game, completeness results, uh, connecting it to, uh, you know, classical tools from coding theory and, and or PCPs, as I mentioned before. And these, uh, these tools are very essential in the development of this uh, final result, MIP star, uh, equal RE. So it's not, uh, you know, it relies heavily, in fact, on the whole history I told you in this uh, in this lecture. And this was essential to basically have the consequences as well. Okay, that's more or less what I want to tell you. Maybe we uh, summarize. Um, so we saw lots and lots of uh, proof systems here. We saw that allowing interaction, randomness, and errors in proofs lead to very paradoxical properties of uh, of proof systems that are cannot exist in deterministic ones like NP. Uh, in many, uh, like in, in general uh, theory, uh, you know these were very useful concepts, and uh, theory predate, predated the. Uh, uh, uses in both uh, practical applications and in um, science and uh, mathematics. Uh, it's uh, again something common in computational complexity that uh, it all often reveals connections between different subdisciplines in, in math, computer science, physics, and others. And uh, repeating myself, uh, it demonstrates the power of this. Uh, methodology of uh, computational complexity on focusing on modeling, algorithmic efficiency, classifications of problems into classes, having reductions between them and studying completeness, the hardest problems in classes and so on. It all manifests itself in this work. Um, my last slide is uh, constant these days. I uh, For people who want to uh, read more about computational complexity, about other aspects besides proof systems. Uh, I wrote a book and uh, published it a few years ago, and it's uh, available freely on my website. So, uh, you know, take a look. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avi.